Welcome to Ellie High Network. I'm your host, Ariana Butler, a fifth grader from my elementary school. Lessons on TV. Choose Union has launched a major initiative called Learning This and Stop. Let's check in with Ashley Curry from Ron Brown High School and Kayla Green from Anacostia High School. Lesson 2 will be conducted by Ashley Butler from McKinley Tech. Let's see what we can learn today. Hi, I'm Miss Kearney, and I'm from Ron Brown College Prep High School. And I'm Miss Green from Anacostia High School. Awesome. We're bringing it to you for the last time, WTU's Learning Doesn't Stop High School Math Series. Today's lesson can be facilitated with a pencil and paper and a cal calculator. <laughs> awesome. We're just going to share the screen so we can get started. OK, now let's switch to the PowerPoint. Okay, so last week we explored the math involved with the car buying process. You were tasked with active research to determine the car you desire and the monthly payment to fulfill the loan. This week, we will use our understanding of the math concepts explored throughout the series and in the context of finance to model the home buying process. Our four week series capstone involves taking on the role of a banker to determine if you would approve a home buyer for a loan. We're ready for deal or no deal. Okay, before we get started, let's center ourselves. Look at the visual, silently take five seconds to reflect, and for the next 30 seconds, respond by quickly sketching, jotting down, or verbally sharing with someone around you the reaction to the prompt below. How might the image relate to the energy or attitude we choose to bring to this experience today? 30 seconds on the clock. Okay, go ahead and wrap up those thoughts. Hopefully you're able to channel some tranquility as we make the most of this distance learning experience. And hopefully you're also feeling like you have a really strong foundation as we move into today's capstone. Let's hear what Paris Lewis has to think. Hey, Ms. Kearney, I'm already checking in. You know, it's been about four weeks and I think I'm ready to see the houses that you and Ms. Green have found for me. And I wanna see if it's deal or no deal. Okay, Ms. Kearney, so what are we learning today? All right, so I heard what Purse is thinking about and we are ready to deliver. So we're going to evaluate a present value of annuity function to model the home buying process when we're given a verbal description. We're hoping that all students are familiar with the vocabulary that we've been using, annuity, common ratio, finite geometric series, initial value, and interest. Context of this problem, we're talking about the present value function, mortgage, and recurrent payments. The essential questions that we're hoping you'll be able to answer as you go throughout this lesson and then your additional research afterwards is what additional costs go into home buying? And then what does it take to maintain a house? Uh, how might your savings plan from week one and week two support goal setting for the down payment? And also, how is a mortgage like the car loan problem we did last week or two weeks ago? And how is it different? Sounds like some of this needs a lot of research. We did a lot of research and one of the things we do have to take into account is like escrow fees and we also have to take into account like where the property is located. There's so many things, but honestly, we found some houses that we like and we can't wait to show you. Let's check it out. I found a house in Anacostia that I really like. It is a five bedroom, five bath, three deck house. That's $1,125,000 and 3,841 square feet. I found a house in my school, it's $379,900. Two bedroom, two bathroom, and it's 1,114 square feet. It's a good color too. Okay, let's take it to today's two-piece. Let's consider these factors. How have redlining and gentrification impacted people of color in accessing prime real estate? And how might home ownership influence intergenerational mobility? What do you think, Ms. Kearney? Yeah, I definitely think we should consider it. Okay, so let's revisit the present value of the annuity function uh, that we used during the car loan lesson last week. We slightly rearranged it so that we can easily determine the monthly payment for a given time period when we already know what loan amount we need. So that's what we're going to be using today. 
All right, so I've been looking at some salaries just to take into account that I'm gonna need some money to be able to buy a house and so forth. No brainer, I chose a teacher. The medium income salary for a teacher in DCPS is like a little over $56,000 right now and you only need a four year degree. So I've considered some factors into the salary and I also think about the salary increases over time. So yeah, I chose a teacher. Okay, so let's figure out the problem we're working today. Okay, so with my salary, I would like the bank to approve me for a 30 year mortgage because I saw that that was kind of standard max interest rate at like 5% for the home that I chose over in War 7. Okay, so that all sounds great, but I'm going to give you a few constraints. Your annual payment to escrow is going to be 1.2% of your home's selling price. And you also have to put down a 10% down payment on this home. The bank can only approve a mortgage if the total monthly payment for the home, including the payment to escrow, does not exceed 30% of your monthly salary. You ready? Yeah, you're trying to hold me back. All right, so my data can get messy because it's a real world situation, but I also know that I'm gonna deal with pencil paper, a few rounding things, but I'm ready. Okay, let's switch to the doc cam. Okay, so based on the house that I want, $379.9, and my salary, based on DCPS uh, beginner teacher salary that I'm looking at, um, and your constraints allow me to have a monthly salary of $56,313 divided by the 12 months, a little less than $5,000 a month. And then 30% of that monthly salary is actually going to leave me with $1,407.83. If I have to do a 10% down payment uh, using the actual selling price of the home, 10% of my home is going to be $37,990. Woo, that's a lot safe. Glad we did week one. How much money is paid into escrow is going to be 1.2% of the selling price. Okay, and that's annual. It looks like my problem is telling me that I want the bank to approve me for a 30-year mortgage. Since we're talking about 12 months, I'm going to change 30 years, that unit, to months. 30 years with 12 months each year, I'm gonna multiply that and that's gonna give me 360 months. I know that I want an annual, so that's yearly, I want an annual interest rate of 5% for the home. 5% is annual, so if I want that for the month, I'm gonna take the 5% and divide it by 12. If I take 5%, here's my calculator, I just wanna make sure it's visible, I'm gonna take 5% and divide it by 12, and that's going to give me about 0 0.0042. So approximately 0 0.0042 for my interest each month. That said, it's important for me to go ahead and formulate the problem. Well, I know that the present value of the function is going to really be the loan amount that I'm trying to get. I know that this is going to be my recurring payment. My recurring payment is going to be the present value times the interest that we found but I have to take into account that my selling price has to include my little savings that I have. So I'm going to take away my down, my down payment of 10%. And that's going to leave me with the loan amount I'm trying to buy, uh, borrow, the present value. So that said, I know that the selling price of my home is $379.9. My down payment is $37,990. And then that leaves me with the present value. Let me go ahead and take my handy dandy calculator. I'll take $379,9. And I'll subtract $37,990. And that's going to give me the present value loan amount that I want to borrow at $341,910. Okay. If I take that, I can now go ahead and put this information into my function and start to compute. So I have the reoccurring payment is equal to the present value of the loan amount that I'm trying to borrow times the interest rate that I found all over one minus the common ratio, which is the quantity of one plus the interest raised to the period of 360 months. That said, I can go ahead and pick up my calculator again and start to work out these quantities. So I'll take that value and I'll multiply it times 0.0042. And that's going to leave me with 1436.02 approximately all over one minus this ratio to that period all over one minus one plus that interest 
brace to the negative 360 period, make sure I can see it, that's gonna give me approximately 0.78. When I look at this, I'll take 1436.02 and divide it by 0.78, and that's gonna give me about 1841, so $1,841.05. One okay, looks like my reoccurring payment is 1841.05, but I know that you told me I gotta add my escrow. So if I add my escrow, my escrow is going to be 1.2% of my selling price, and that is $379.90. So I'm gonna add $379.90. To 1841.05 plus 379.90, and that's going to give me 220.95. 22.20.95. All right, so my interpretation is that given the constraints you gave me, my monthly starting salary is going to be $1,407.83. But my monthly payment on the house is going to be $2,220.95. Wow, Ms. Kearney. So you did a lot of great work with using the present value of annuity function. And I could verify that using the future value of annuity function by thinking about the problem like a savings account. So if we deposit a payment of R into an account monthly and let that monthly money accumulate and earn interest for 30 years, then we could model the future value of annuity and we could determine that the monthly loan payment in addition to escrow is greater than 30% of your monthly salary of 1407.83. Let's turn it to Kyrie to see what he thinks. Hey, Ms. Kearney, I will not approve that loan because the monthly payment on how to exceed your monthly salary. That sounds like no deal, Miss Kearney. Wow, Kyrie is hardballing, but that's probably a good decision. Let's see, what's the weekend challenge then? Well, I want you to determine a salary or a desired income and a house that you wanna purchase in the future. You're gonna identify the salary and the present cost of the house by doing some action, action research. And then you're gonna realize this by determining the amount of time your money needs to work in a savings account in order to make a 10% down payment on your home. Then you're gonna use your yearly income to determine if a bank would approve you for a 30, 20, and 15 year mortgage at a 5% interest and 1.2% escrow. How's that sound? Ooh, that sounds good. Hopefully I figure out something that works because I tell you, I was hoping I would get approved today. Hard to hear no deal. Anyway, can I text to get some additional problems this last time before y'all go at WTUHS to the number you gave me, 830-268-4310? Absolutely. You can also get some additional problems and share your mindful minute. Awesome. Okay. I know that this lesson plan is going to be translated to Spanish and put on the WT website by Catherine Navila at Check and Veronica Torres at Truesdale. I also want to make sure we shout out Kyrie and Paris for being student of the week just for doing this particular lesson with us today. Yes, indeed. Okay, so let's switch back and stop sharing so that we can sign off. Just a few technical difficulties. We can do it from right here. Just so you guys know, it has been extremely great working with you today. It's been a pleasure working with you for the past four weeks. And it's our last series, but remember, learning doesn't stop. All right, see you next time. Hello. My name is Alicia Butler, and I'm an 11th grade U.S. history teacher for the District of Columbia Public Schools. Today's topic is, how does war transform society? And it comes directly from the 11th grade distance learning unit five, trouble at home and abroad, the U.S. during World War II. What are our goals for today? Well, we'd like to number one, examine U.S. foreign policy prior to the outbreak of World War II explain why the U.S. eventually entered the war, and then lastly, evaluate how the war impacted and transformed U.S. society. Now, our ultimate goal is to be able to get to objective number three. However, um, this presentation, because of our limited amount of time, will only be able to cover objectives one and two. 
When I see you next time, we'll go back, revisit Objective 3, and all the information together will be able to help you um, answer today's essential question of how war transforms society. What's our purpose? Well, we definitely want to be able to provide students with context, also known as historical background information about the assignment's era of focus, particularly for document A in your 11th grade distance learning weeks four through five packet. However, we also like to provide students with a better understanding of today's foreign policy and the government's response to COVID-19. So I'd like to revisit um, some note-taking strategies that I gave you when we last met. Um, we went over Cornell Notes. Um, just as a quick review, Cornell Notes is basically when you take your essential question, you jot it down here at the top of your page, and then you listen through the PowerPoint and the presentation, and you jot down whatever notes that you hear that you see, and then you go back and you revisit those notes when you're done, and you try to create questions, and you put them here in this column. And the notes are the only thing that will be able to help you answer these questions. But you don't just stop right there. You want to still be able to use this information. You go back, you take all the information you jot down under the questions in the notes, and you try to use that to be able to answer today's essential question. And you jot that down here in the summary part. But I also like to give you a new um, note-taking strategy. This is also known as charting. This works very well for history lectures, and it really helps you to be able to see relationships. And you should definitely use this whenever your essential question focuses on cause and effect. So it works like this. Once again, jot down that essential question so you know what your focus is. You jot down here in a column labeled events, um, all the major events that you hear in the presentation. Then right next to it in this column, you jot down what were the causes of these events. And then in this column, whatever you hear as an effect of these events, you jot them down here. But probably the most important aspect of this note-taking strategy is to make sure that you also listen out for the significance of each of these events and you jot them down here. Just like Cornell notes, when you're done, you take all the information that you've um, pretty much jotted down in these columns, revisit that essential question, and see how can you now answer that essential question. And you do that here in the summary part. Also, just wanted to give you some tips on how you can make this particular presentation work for you. Don't try to copy down every word. Write down all terms in bold print. Listen for and record the main ideas or events. Analyze the images to help explain and reinforce the text in the presentation. Keep the essential question visible and see how each slide helps answer it. Definitely utilize Cornell Notes or that new strategy, charting, that I just showed you. So let's get started. Well, what was Roosevelt's foreign policy like? Um, initially, he believed in isolationism. You have to understand that he is coming to office at the height of the Great Depression. He cares about the economy, not necessarily world domination. So he gives the Philippines their freedom. Cuba is released from that Platt Amendment. Panama is given more control over the Panama Canal. He renounces the Monroe Doctrine's support of armed intervention. He acknowledges the Soviet Union, and he definitely lowers tariffs. He also implements a new policy known as the Good Neighbor Policy. He wants to establish a better relationship with Latin America because he might need their help um, in defeating European aggressors. Well, what type of aggression is going on in Europe? Well, you got Adolf Hitler in Germany, Benito Mussolini in Italy, Joseph Stalin is in USSR, and you also have Emperor Hirohito in Japan. And all of these leaders were taking charge of countries that were very dissatisfied with the outcome of World War I. Then you also have alliances that are forming. Hitler and Mussolini joined together in the Rome-Berlin Axis. You have Japan invading China, looking for natural resources, and Italy invading Ethiopia. And the League of Nations basically is unable to thwart any of these activities. Very quickly, however, Americans declare their neutrality. You got senators like Gerald Nye and the Nye Report uh, accused big businesses of fueling World War I so that they could make a profit. And Americans do not want this to happen again. So you have a lot of people that are backing isolationism, particularly people in the Midwest, and you also have Republicans um, as well. And the Republicans control Congress, so they heavily influenced American foreign policy. So what are some of these policies? They're commonly known as the Neutrality Acts. You got the Neutrality Act of 1935, which allows the president to outlaw selling weapons to country at war and to forbid Americans from traveling on ships of countries that are at war. Um, you have the Neutrality Act of 1936, which outlaws, um, outlaws excuse me, loans and credits to countries that are at war. And it's funny because if you really look closely, these are all things that we did during World War I. So we're trying to definitely not repeat them again for World War II. 
Oh, I wanted just to go back to this political cartoon. I love it because it really kind of summarizes the feelings of a lot of uh, members of Congress. So you have Europe, which is here on fire, and then you have a gentleman here that's supposed to represent Europe. Now, how do I know that? I know that because if you take a look, there's clues. Political cartoons always give you clues. On his pant leg, it says Congress, and this is a very popular image or representation of, of Roosevelt. And underneath his foot, it says whether to amend the Neutrality Act or not. So they're having this very heated a debate about the neutrality acts while Europe is on fire. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, you got Hitler violating the Versailles Treaty. Um, he implements compulsory military service. He marches into the Rhineland. He takes the Sudetenland. And after taking the Sudetenland, he turns right back around and takes the rest of Czechoslovakia. Um, now, while all this is happening, Roosevelt is really trying to test the waters and see how strongly the country was pro-isolationism. He gives a speech proposing democracies work together to quarantine aggressive countries. And we all know what quarantine means um, in uh, you know today's atmosphere, particularly under the coronavirus, right? Um, but the American response was very negative. Um, the Americans still don't want to get involved. Nevertheless, Roosevelt does begin to increase defense spending. Well, while this is happening, Stalin and Hitler sign a non-aggression treaty. Hitler wants to invade Poland without being interrupted or attacked by the US, um, USSR. And on September 1st, 1939, Hitler invades Poland and Poland falls very swiftly. After this happens, ladies and gentlemen, Great Britain and France declare war. World War II has officially started. Um, and it escalates from there. Hitler takes France, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg very, very quickly due to a military strategy known as Blitzkrieg, um, which is a military campaign where you, you know, very quickly um, and intensely attack your opponents uh, to bring about a swift victory. When this happens, England pretty much remains alone um, to fight both Mussolini and Hitler. And I've always been intrigued by this picture. It's um, commonly known as the Weeping Frenchman of 1940, and it's basically like a snapshot photograph of um, a, a French man um, who was weeping um, after the French flag is being taken down, and that's a result of Germany invading and occupying. Well, um, Americans still don't want to get involved, but they definitely do support strengthening their defenses. They pass a conscription law. Um, they begin to build planes and increase the Navy. Um, Roosevelt reactivates the Monroe Doctrine by entering into a formal agreement with other Latin American countries to protect democracy in the Americas. Um, Roosevelt begins to try to persuade Congress to adopt new policy, and he tries to kind of like um, chip away the neutrality acts or better yet find a back door. Um, and his first task was doing that with the cash and carry policy. It gave the illusion of being neutral, um, but he knew that Great Britain really were the ones that control the seas. So the policy basically stated this, countries could buy U.S. weapons, but you got to pay cash and you got to come pick it up and then carry it back to your country. Definitely trying to um, prevent um, a repeat of World War I. I love this political cartoon, once again, to really help us understand what the cash and carry did. Um, here's a gentleman representing the Neutrality Acts. How do I know? I'm looking for the clues. It says Neutrality Act right here. He's an old man of the sea. His long beard is going across the seas, and it's providing aid that will win. Right. And the boat is going in this direction, which means that, you know, most likely they came, they picked it up and now they're heading back home, which is definitely what the cash and carry did. Roosevelt does something extremely significant. All right. He um, passes a peacetime draft. First time ever in U.S. history we've had a draft during time of peace. He also um, begins to pass a new policy known as destroyers for basis deals. It basically gives Great Britain 50 older destroyers, and these are what destroyers are, in exchange for rights to build American bases on British controlled land. The situation is getting very dire, ladies and gentlemen. There's almost so much cash that England is going to have um, to be able to give the United States under the cash and carry policy. So what's the next thing? Give us land. All right. And then we'll go ahead and give you um, destroyers. But even then, um, you know, uh, there's almost only so much land that you can give as well. So we end the cash and carry policy and we now gravitate towards um, the Lend-Lease Act, which is now the U.S. will loan Britain weapons on credit. You know, go ahead, I'll loan it to you, come get it, and um, you can use this for the war effort. And at that point, most Americans are really in favor of aiding Great Britain. 
We also, another demonstration of us kind of moving further and further away from neutrality and closer towards entering the wars with the Atlantic Charter. Um, he knew it was a matter of time um, before they were going to officially enter the war. So Roosevelt had a meeting with Winston Churchill of Great Britain, and basically they met in um, uh, Newfoundland, and they created kind of like the uh, an idea or a plan for what they wanted the world to look like when the war is over very similar to the 14 points in the sense that we're thinking of what the world will look like after the war is over it included um, very progressive policies such as eliminating dictators disarmaments no real territorial changes after the war and then ladies and gentlemen we go from all-out neutrality to fighting an undeclared war um, roosevelt orders the u.s navy to escort british ships that are carrying lend lease material from u.s shores um, he orders the Navy to pretty much shoot on sight all German ships after an American destroyer Greer was attacked by a German submarine. So why is this significant if you're using this charting technique for your notes? We're going from neutrality to fighting pretty much an undeclared war. And then we also have tensions that are brewing with Japan. Um, the U.S. outlawed the shipment of steel and scrap iron to all countries except for Britain and nations of the Western Hemisphere, and we do that in response to the Japanese joining the Axis powers. Um, and the United States also outlawed selling oil to Japan after the Japanese occupied into China, which we now know as Vietnam. And the situation definitely comes to a head on December 7th, 1941, where Japan surprise attacks the United States, attacks a naval air base in Hawaii, and over 2,400 Americans were killed. Roosevelt goes to Congress the next day, and Congress basically declares war. Well, Germany um, honors the Axis Treaty that it has with Japan and declares war on the United States along with Italy. So hopefully um, you should now be able to take the information that you learned in today's presentation to be able to answer um, these seven questions. And the first two, three questions are definitely um, part of the assignment for document A um, in the 11th grade district learning packets for this week. You should be able to number one, summarize what our initial foreign policy was prior to the outbreak of World War II. You should be able to explain how memories of U.S. involvement in World War I influenced U.S. policy towards entering the war. You should also be able to explain how and why U.S. policy regarding entrance into World War II changed over time. But here are my favorite questions, definitely higher order. Predict two problems the U.S. might encounter as it gets ready for war. Now, of course, that's not in the presentation, but you definitely are going to use what you learned from the presentation to make these predictions. That's what makes it so higher order. Also, predict two examples of the demands the war is going to make on ordinary citizens. Now that we're officially in, what do you think the demands are going to be made of citizens? And do you think that these de demands are going to be different from what was demanded of us in World War I? So now I'm forcing you to use the information that you learned today, make predictions, and compare it to what you learned before from World War I so you don't forget that information. It still remains relevant. Lastly, Evaluate the lesson modern day politicians can learn in the events that led to World War II and U.S. entrance into World War II as well. What do you think politicians can learn from the lessons that we got from why we entered the war and what our policy was like before the war? And then most importantly, determine what do you think was the most important facts you learned from today's lesson and why? I hope today's presentation was helpful, ladies and gentlemen. I will see you soon. Have a great day.